Um, our first presentation today is with Jen Chandler. Um, she is the Southeast Region Manager here at the Guild, and she holds a BA in Business Administration from Transylvania University, a BS in Biology from Northern Kentucky University, and a PhD in Biology from West Virginia University. And before joining the Guild, Jen was an assistant professor of biology whose research focused on two main projects, exploring the responsibility with the response of American ginseng to both anthropogenic and natural canopy disturbances and investigating the impact of spotted, spotted lanternfly, an invasive plant hopper on forest species in the mid-Atlantic area. And about that ginseng thing, uh, Jen did give the presentation for our first um, event in this series back in August. So if you missed that, I definitely highly recommend seeing it. It's really interesting and she did a lot of great work. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Jen. Thanks so much, uh, Dakota. And thank you all very much for um, joining us today. We're excited to have two really great experts um, who are gonna come on after me talk about some of the risks and, and risk mitigation for um, Central Appalachian critical biodiversity area. So my goal is to just very briefly give you an overview of the Central Appalachian CBA. All right, so the specified risk area for the Central Appalachian Critical Biodiversity Area uh, encompasses much of the Central Appalachian Forest ecoregion. And as you can see in the map, it includes portions of Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky, and also West Virginia. Uh, the Central Appalachian CBA, which is what I'll refer to it from now on, uh, is considered an area with high conservation value due to high overall species richness, diversity, and uniqueness when compared to other sites in the same um, biogeographic area. And uh, this was determined using NatureServe and uh, TNC data. There are two main drivers of regional in the Central Appalachians is the broadleaf mixed mesophytic forests and also aquatic habitats. So let's talk first about the mixed mesophytic forests. Again, just a very brief overview. Um, the Central Appalachian region is characterized by several different and quite unique forest types. And the composition that we see varies as a function of geological history, uh, changes in elevation, diverse topography and climate. And really these components come together to make unique macroclimates that are able to support high levels of diversity. Um, and I've put some of my very favorite um, sexy species, I'll call them on this slide, wood thrush, of course, American ginseng. Um, this CBA corresponds largely to the higher elevation portions of Ala um, Appalachian mixed mesophytic forest area. Um, and these mountains are interesting in that they can harbor both northern species and also southern species in the same broad uh, geographic area. And this is one of the um, things that cause such great diversity um, in central Appalachia. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that these forests support, some, uh, support a great diversity of tree species, but also some of the highest herbaceous understory diversity in the world. Um, and as a result, incredibly high um, wildlife species diversity, um, very rich in songbirds and also uh, salamanders is another big one. So when we think about some of the threats to this system, the mixed mesophytic forests, uh, forest management activities once had substantial negative impacts on the mixed meso mesophytic forests in the CBA, and we still do see lasting impacts of um, this management. Uh, but now the focus has shifted to other risk factors. And those include, of course, climate change, which is far, um, far more broad than just central Appalachia, um, mining pollution, infrastructure, uh, and particularly rights of ways and um, roads. And something that I'm particularly interested in is overabundance of white-tailed deer. So if you look at the picture on the top of this slide, what you see on the left is a forest with a healthy understory. And then on the right is a forest that has been overbrowsed 
um, by white-tailed deer, so very little understory left. And again, I'm not going to get too in-depth in any of this um, because I just wanted to give a general overview. So the first system of interest, mixed mesophytic forests. The second system um, are aquatic habitats, and I'm, I'm going to um, let our next expert um, speak to you more about this because she's going to be talking um, exclusively about aquatic habitats. But there are a few things that I do want to mention. Um, aquatic habitats in the central Appalachian region uh, in this CBA are considered the rich, richest temperate freshwater ecosystems in the entire world. Um, more aquatic species are endemic to this area than anywhere else in the world. So in other words, there are a lot of species that can only be found here. And this is a really big deal. Uh, and some of these endemic species include fish, mussels, crayfish, and a multitude of other invertebrates. So let's talk then about some of the threats to these aquatic habitats in Central Appalachian CBA. Um, a lot of the threats come from incompatible forest management and a lack of best management practice implementation. Um, and again, the other experts are gonna to touch on this. Uh, but these include hydrologic alterations uh, due partially to forest practices and conversion. Um, and a lot of this also has to do with ditching that may be required in wetter areas. Um, reductions in water quality due to loss of riparian forested buffers, uh, which can result in increased sedimentation. And also um, fairly severe erosion of riverbanks, especially in steeper areas that don't have appropriate buffers. Uh, some other activities that also pose a risk to aquatic systems that are, are not forest management based include um, agriculture, so a lot of runoff from agriculture, uh, development, and then mining practices within Central App. So that's just a very brief overview of the main systems that drive the biodiversity in Central Appalachia and also um, some of the general threats that we see in these areas. Um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dakota and uh, to Madison, who's going to be getting quite a bit more in depth with this. Great, thanks, Jen. And if anybody has any questions throughout any of our presenters presentations, um, feel free to type them into the chat box and they'll be answered at the very end. We have um, some time set aside for questions for all of our presenters today. But up next, um, we have a presentation by Madison Ball from Friends of the Cheat in West Virginia, looking at aquatic biodiversity of the region through the lens of the Cheat River. And Madison received her BS degree in 2014 in natural resource management and shortly thereafter moved to Bartow, West Virginia to serve as a watershed and fisheries AmeriCorps with the Monongahela National Forest for two years. And she also served as a watershed technician for West Virginia Trout Unlimited and the US Forest Service and was a seasonal environmental educator with experience learning formerly the Mountain Institute at Spruce Knob, West Virginia. And so we're really uh, appreciative and lucky to have her today to talk a bit about what's going on in the Cheat River specifically. So Madison, I hand it off to you. Thanks, Dakota. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today at the Forest Stewards Guild uh, Appalachian Cove uh, series. This is really exciting. Um, I really think the Cheat River watershed makes a nice case study to, in segue for what uh, Jen had covered uh, before me, so I'm excited to just um, go ahead and dive in. So a little bit about uh, the Cheat River watershed. Um, we're a fairly large um, Huck 8 level watershed. I've got a map here showing our exact size in reference to West Virginia. Uh, so our uh, drainage is approximately a little over 1400 square miles. Um, and um, we, I've got some of our larger tributaries broken out in different colors. Um, and the Cheat River, it flows north and meets the Monongahela River and is a tributary to the Ohio River Basin. Um, and a little bit about Friends of the Cheat. So we are a uh, nonprofit watershed group based in Kingwood, West Virginia, um, in the lower part of the Cheat watershed, um, kind of in this light blue uh, um, 
area here. And we've been around since 1994 um, to combat some of the serious um, acid mine drainage issues in the Cheat River watershed. Um, and that was our original uh, mission. And since we've kind of grown to expand that to include other restoration practices, which I'll get into a little bit further. Um, about the biodiversity of the Cheat River, um, we're a very biodiverse uh, river system. Um, we have approximately uh, 45 different species of fish out of the 178 fish species present in West Virginia. Um, we have many sensitive and threatened species, um, including Eastern Hellbender, um, as well as uh, acidic um, sensitive fish, including walleye, um, smallmouth bass. Um, we also have many endemic species that are found in the Cheat River system and nowhere else on earth. Um, and that includes the cheat minnow, um, the cheat mountain salamander, and also we have um, a species of snail called the flat spired three tooth snail that is only found in the cheat canyon and nowhere else um, on the planet, which is pretty unique. Um, we also have unique uh, scour plant communities um, that are reliant on the ice scour that comes through in the wintertime in the cheat river system. Um, and we also have some extirpated species that um, originally would have been found in the cheat, but due to the legacy of acid mine drainage are no longer found here, um, particularly eight species of freshwater mussel. Um, and going into that further, uh, the historic resource extraction um, in the Cheat River system has been um, pretty extensive and complex. Uh, we were part of um, what's known in West Virginia as the Big Cut, um, which happened in the early 1900s when a large vast majority of the state was clear cut for logging purposes. Um, this photo here uh, was actually taken in the Cheat River watershed. This is one of probably hundreds of, if not, you know, more, um, you know, bo lo logging boom towns that occurred, um, not only in the Cheat River main stem, but the vast majority of our major tributaries. Um, and then also, uh, we have had extensive coal mining operations in the Cheat River watershed, specifically in the lower reach. Um, this photo on the right was taken in 1988. This is the Cheat Canyon um, that I was speaking of that is home to the snail. And um, as you can see, this um, dramatic orange color that you see staining the, uh, the channel is um, the effects of acid mine drainage um, to the watershed. So that's iron, um, very low pH. And then we also have uh, severe aluminum problems at this time. Um, and although that, you know, we had a legacy of resource issues in the cheat, specifically acid mine drainage, um, we also had a very significant blowout event in 1994 and in 1995. Um, this aerial shot is the cheat river. Um, it's actually flowing from right to left. So, um, yeah, left is downstream. And then um, you see there's this very dramatic orange staining. This was taken in 1994. Um, this small tributary you see here, this is Muddy Creek. Um, and there was a massive mine blowout in 1994 and in 1995 um, that made its way to the cheat, just further exacerbating the issues with acid mine drainage. And I've got a short video. I just really wanted to highlight the magnitude of um, the water that came out of this site. Um, it's pretty significant. Um, so I've got a short clip of someone who was able to observe this blowout when it was occurring in 1994. I had been working on the river that day, on the Cheat River, on a whitewater trip. And uh, on my way back, I noticed along Muddy Creek, along Route 26, where the blowout occurred, a huge amount of water coming out of the hill. And that was kind of looked like a uh, giant aerial spraying had been done of the river. The rocks along the right-hand side, the Muddy Creek side of the cheek, were just coated with acid mine drainage. Uh, and it was strong enough to burn your eyes, burn your lips, and so on. All 
right. And we'll continue with um, moving forward. But, you know, as you could see from such a dramatic event uh, by the early 1990s, we had lost um, or it has been presumed that we have lost, you know, our eight species of freshwater mussels that were native to the cheat. Um, throughout the 1900s, we had multiple fish kills that occurred throughout the main stem, not just the lower reach. Um, the photograph you see here, um, this was a photograph taken, I believe, in 1929, um, where there was a massive fish kill near Rollsburg. Um, and it can't all just be attributed to acid mine drainage. There's a historic report that suggests that some of these fish kills were because of a mixture of acid mine drainage, sedimentation from large um, logging operations, um, pollutants from tanneries, as well as um, the discharge of sewage into the cheat. So this kind of all mixed together and created a, an extremely toxic environment for aquatic organisms. Um, at, you know, by the 1940s, it's believed that walleye, um, which are very acid intolerant, as are smallmouth bass, um, were completely extirpated from the Cheat River system, um, especially the lower reach. Uh, at this point, eastern hellbender were thought to have been extirpated from the lower reach as well. Um, and the pH at Cheat Lake, which is the near the terminus of the Cheat River, um, about three miles from the mouth of the Cheat River, we have a large reservoir called Cheat Lake. Um, at this point, the pH in this lake was less than five on average um, in the early 90s and was dominated by two, only two species of um, extremely pollution tolerant fish. I believe they were um, white sucker and brown um, bullhead. Um, and, the, and pretty much you weren't gonna find much of anything else in that lake. Um, and in 1995, we were officially named um, one of America's most endangered rivers by the nonprofit group um, American Rivers. So with all of this, um, you know, history of resource extraction and uh, degradation in the cheat, when we were formed, it was very difficult, you know, to decide where to start as a small, newly formed nonprofit. Um, but we were able to make progress. Um, and I think our biggest strength was bringing attention to the issue, um, raising our voices to address that we were no longer wanting to be tolerant of the condition of the cheat and wanted to see change. Um, we formed a river of promise task force that I think was critical to the success of the cheat that was unique in the way that um, we opened this task force to not only uh, state and federal agencies, but also private corporations, including um, energy, uh, you know, energy producing uh, companies to address these issues and to help take initiative to clean up the cheat. So um, that's kind of where we started. We also had large outreach events, including our annual Cheat River Festival, where we brought uh, local music and um, live, you know, live performances to the, the banks of the Cheat River to address the issues and raise funds um, to begin tackling this immense problem. And then we had to begin to prioritize our AMD acid mine drainage sources. So um, just for relevance, the Cheat has over 300, and that's what this, this map is displaying. Um, we have over 300 sources of acid mine drainage in the Cheat. So trying to figure out which one to tackle first was obviously a, a large challenge for us. Um, and we're always looking to um, be adaptive in our next project and learn from our um, challenges that we've faced on previous projects. So um, that's where we've started. And um, today uh, we've had lots of success, which is incredible. Um, and we got there through a few different tactics, including restoration, um, preservation, and best management practices. So in terms of restoration, um, these photos on the right, this is one of our worst sources of acid mine drainage. You can see here my coworker, she's standing on, we call it a scab, it's an iron formation um, from the acidic water. Uh, this was one of the worst sources to one of our tributaries, uh, Beaver Creek. 
And this summer we um, installed a passive treatment system there to um, buffer the source of acidity and also to keep the aluminum and iron on site rather than going downstream and eventually uh, making its way to the cheat. Um, in terms of preservation, we've also advocated for the preservation of unique and special areas, including the Cheat River Canyon, which was put into state hands. Um, it is now managed by the West Virginia Department of Natural uh, Resources in 2014. Um, and a portion of that is also managed by the Nature Conservancy. And additionally, um, we always advocate for best management practices that occur on private land. Um, the mixture of public to private ownership in the Cheat River watershed is approximately 30% public um, and the rest is, happens on private land. So we try to advocate for the best management practices that can occur um, privately. Uh, the photo on the left, um, this is considered the Cheat River Narrows. It's a section, um, a, a very popular whitewater section of the Cheat, but it's actually um, the lands next to it are owned by a private timber company. And we've just, we've never had any issues. Um, and I've always noticed that they, uh, when they do harvest, it appears that they're using best management practices because we haven't seen any negative effects from when they do harvest, which is, which is great. Um, so moving forward, um, after 25 years, working with a diverse network of partners, both private and public um, input, um, we are lucky to say that our river has become, um, we are reborn essentially. Um, our pH is circumneutral, meaning it is um, in a healthy range of um, uh, either mid sixes to mid sevens. Um, the Muddy Creek that you saw in the video, um, its pH is also now circumneutral. There has been extensive efforts and millions of dollars that have been spent to uh, treat that water that is still emanating from that mine um, and several other um, abandoned mine lands in that area. Um, we've seen the return of acid intolerant species. This is one of our greatest um, achievements in my opinion. We, um, that is only possible with the help of our partners. Um, so walleye and smallmouth bass are now utilizing this lower reach that was once highly degraded. Um, we have also seen Eastern Hellbender um, be reported in the Cheat River watershed. And we conducted our first ever um, eDNA study for Cheat or for Eastern Hellbender um, this fall. So we'll have the results of where they may or may not be present um, later in 2021. Um, we've also seen improvements in sediment conditions, um, obviously compared to the big cut when uh, most of our, you know, watershed was clear cut. Obviously, we've seen a dramatic improvement since those logging practices are no longer taking place on, especially not on that scale. Um, and just generally, we've noticed an overall improvement in water quality. Uh, however, um, with progress comes new challenges. Uh, we have now pivoted to include new restoration activities um, and try to tackle some uh, either more difficult or different problems or a mixture of the two. So we are pivoting now. Um, we continue our acid mine drainage treatment work. Um, we are basically booked for projects related to acid mine drainage remediation until 2033. So we've got our plates full there. Um, each year we're about able to implement a passive acid mine drainage treatment project about one of them per year. Um, so we've identified um, enough sites up until 2033 uh, with obviously contingent on grant funding. Um, but we are now pivoting to include riparian reforestation efforts. So we've identified uh, priority water uh, sub watersheds and priority reaches within those sub watershed for private partnership to improve our riparian buffers in the Cheat River watershed. Um, we're looking at dam removal. This is a photograph of the Albright uh, Power Dam. Um, it's only the one of only two dams on the 78 mile long Cheat River. Um, with its removal, we will reconnect 75 miles of Cheat River main stem and hundreds of miles of tributaries. So that's an extremely exciting um, new project for Friends of the Cheat. 
We have also started to promote some of these outstanding natural qualities through the development of um, recreational opportunities, including a rail trail along a um, old railroad grade that will follow the river and um, as well as some improvements to existing trails in the watershed. Um, however, we still have the same problems that we started with. Um, the photo on the right is our worst contributing untreated source to the Cheat River. This is Lick Run. You can see by the photograph um, during low flows, this um, source of acidine drainage more or less creates an acidic barrier to aquatic life. Um, the pH you know, of this source is below three. Um, it's extremely acidic. Um, the metal loadings are um, definitely some of the worst in our watershed and it truly prevents you know, uh, fish from migrating upstream and downstream without being affected. Um, so we're still tackling those issues and trying to create new solutions for those types of sources that are um, definitely um, more complicated and more complex than some of the smaller sites that our nonprofit are able to treat. Um, I think with that, uh, I will pass it over or back to Dakota. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Yeah, thank you, Madison. That was great. Um, I definitely learned a lot that I did not know <laughs> about these things. Um, yeah, so up next, we will be hearing from Jeremy McGill from West Virginia Division of Forestry about implementing best management practices for forestry. And Jeremy is a Buckhannon, West Virginia native holding a Bachelor of Science in Forest Resources Management from WVU. He's worked in industry, purchasing timber and overseeing logging operations and also in state government for the Division of Forestry. He was hired by the division in 2002 as one of the first Logging Sediment Control Act foresters to focus on logging inspections. And in 2007, he was promoted to assistant state forester and now serves under state forester Barry Cook. And he oversees the division's logging program and the requirements of the Logging Sediment Control Act, as well as the managed timberland program. So I feel pretty lucky that we have him speaking with us today and I'm excited to hear what he has to say. And so without further ado, Jeremy, I hand it off to you. Thank you, Dakota. And thank you, Madison. I, I was attending um, WVU in Morgantown in the early 90s when those big blowouts happened. And they were quite dramatic at the time. I remember going down to the river and we were doing some projects uh, for some of my labs. And it was, it was quite a mess. Uh, but so the principle, the principles of civil cultural BMPs, we've, we've talked you know, about the importance of the aquatic uh, diversity that we have in the central Appalachian region. And we've looked at the uh, effects that logging and mining can have on it. And I'm no expert on mining by any means, but I probably could be considered an expert at least in the state of West Virginia on civil cultural best management practices. So we're gonna have a little bit of a history lesson on how those came to be, what the, uh, the basis for them is. And then I will touch kind of on multiple states, but specifically with a focus on West Virginia. So let me go, nope, that's the first slide. The, the legal basis for why we have best management practices now lies within the Clean Water Act 1972. But the programs themselves date back much earlier. And as uh, Madison referenced, the big cut, well, that took place in more than just West Virginia. And it caused such a uh, uproar at the time amongst the populace that the industry put into place some voluntary practices, you know, that date back to the early 1900s. In West Virginia, it was around the late 1920s, 1929. And they kind of came up with some standards that they should follow uh, in order that they could stay in business pretty much. 
you know, when you have towns that are getting washed out because literally they've denuded the entire hillside and they've used the streams themselves as railroad beds and sluices, uh, it tends to cause some problems with the hydrologic design and layout of the land. Uh, it is considered non-point source pollution. I mean, for those of you who don't know what that is, non-point source pollution generally comes from a you know, a widespread area versus a pipe coming out of a factory or a specific point. Now, this was challenged in a court case, Decker versus Northwest Environmental Defense Center, which went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, it was, I believe, out in Oregon is where it started. And they basically said that logging roads should be point source because, you know, you can trace the point back to specific stream crossings. Well, in the end, the Supreme Court upheld the longstanding EPA rule, seven to one, that logging roads are non-point source and should be treated as such. So it still remains non-point source and thus is monitored by that. Now, there's some variations. Of course, you know, there are standards that are required under non-point source in the Clean Water Act, but largely those, uh, are pretty much just if there is active stream sedimentation going on, you can get fined by the state EPA or uh, DEP, depending on what state you're in. So there's a, there's a little bit of variation between mandatory programs versus voluntary programs. And in, what, in West Virginia, we have a mandatory program. So ours is set in state code. We have additional uh, requirements that go above and beyond the requirements of the Clean Water Act. And, you know, we can actually levy fines and go in and force compliance as the State Division of Forestry. Uh, some states, they're voluntary programs in that, you know, whether you install the BMPs or not is voluntary. But keep in mind, you can still be fined for violating the Clean Water Act, regardless if it's a voluntary program or not. So now in West Virginia, we're entirely within the Appalachian region. So our topography tends to be uniform enough that we, ours is statewide. We don't have special BMPs for certain watersheds, but you get into states like Virginia where you have coastal plains, Piedmont, the Appalachian mountains, same in North Carolina and South Carolina and uh, Pennsylvania, you get, you get a little more variation. So actually some of their BMPs are more regional or watershed based. Like Maryland, I know they have some specific watershed based best management practices and specific watersheds, you have to use this or that. So what are the principles behind the best management practices? And you're gonna find this is pretty uniform across most of the United States, but especially the Central Appalachian region. And that is to keep water from your disturbed areas separate from your streams. So if you have a ditch line along, along a logging road, you don't want that ditch line feeding directly into a stream. You need to separate that water and filter it out. Also limiting your potential disturbance. You, the smaller area you have disturbed, the less area you have to worry about being a potential source of sediment to the stream. The other big thing, minimize your speed and volume of your overland flow. I mean, water, you know, form the Grand Canyon. Uh, it, it is extremely destructive when it builds up flow and speed. And anybody who's ever seen a flash flood been present, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just amazing what water can do. Proper planning is also another important principle. If you just go out and hop on a machine and start building roads all over the place, you know, you're, you're using your BMPs is gonna be kind of a last minute thought versus where if you plan your roads out ahead of time, plan your stream crossings and try to work out everything where you can minimize all of these above things. You keep your water separate, limit your potential disturbance, you know, if only 8% of your surface area of your job is disturbed versus 12%, you know, that adds up over time over 100 acres. That's a difference of four acres right there. So proper planning is very important. So 
the details. And like I said, you're going to find BMPs in every state, whether they're mandatory or voluntary, they're going to address these things. So you're going to have some sort of streamside management zone, an area around the stream where there are special circumstances that you need to be aware of if you're going to be logging in these areas. Uh, I'll get into West Virginia specifics later, but sometimes there's cut, no cut. Generally, there's going to be some kind of equipment limitation, and there's going to be a defined area of 100 feet or 25 feet or whatever the case may be around that stream that is special. Hall road construction, for those of you who aren't familiar, a hall road, that is vehicular access from the public road to the landing location. So that's where your truck traffic's gonna be. You know, you're dealing, you're talking about a lot of heavy weight, uh, wide vehicles, long vehicles. So there's special consideration that must be taken into account for hall road construction. Landing construction is probably the most disturbed area on the entire site. That's where wood is sorted and loaded onto trucks from where it's brought in from the woods. Skid trail construction, trails basically where you use your equipment, your skid or your dozer, or your yard or whatever it is, to bring the trees to the landing to be loaded and put on a truck. Of course, maintenance, you can build all, you know, incorporate all the BMPs you want. If you don't maintain them, they're going to fail. And uh, this is one of the big areas where we see a lot of violations. People, you know, they try, they put culverts in, but then they have, you know, tree branches fall in and clog them up. They don't take care of them. And you get a big rainstorm and it washes out. Reclamation. When the job's done, you do not want long-term sources of sedimentation to the stream. So properly reclaiming it where it's not going to be a problem down the road is the last final step you know, in the logging operation and is one of the most important besides probably claiming. So like I said, I, I told you I would touch specifically on West Virginia's. Keep in mind, every state in the region is gonna have something very similar to this. They're not all that different. I see them uh, and they're usually pretty close. But in West Virginia, we have two different streamside management areas and they, they vary based on the stream order. And what I mean by the stream order is like perennial, intermittent, or ephemeral. So perennial and intermittent streams, which are streams that run all year long or mostly all year long, are 100 foot slope distance from the stream bank. So if the, you know, if the stream's 50 feet wide or you've got a pretty good size river, which that's, an, that's a perennial stream by our standards, you know, you go from the stream bank, not the middle of the river, or middle of the creek. And uh, stream banks, usually your normal high water flow, it's pretty evident. Uh, ephemerals, which ephemerals are basically ditches that only run when you have rain events or snow melt. They're not going to run most of the year. It can be just like a little drain coming off a hill. It can be a, uh, you know, a spring feed that's a wet weather spring, just something that's not running water all the time. Now in West Virginia, you can harvest trees inside the streamside management zone. Now, some states, they have a limit, like you can only harvest 50% of the crown cover or 75% of the crown cover. In other states, you know, you can't harvest anything. It just depends. Now, what we do require is equipment use and soil disturbance is restricted inside the streamside management zone. And what we ask is you don't go into the streamside management zone with equipment unless you're going to cross the stream. All disturbed soil, you know, if you do go in there, you need to immediately plan how to protect that from getting into the stream. Remember keeping your road water separate from your stream water and reclaimed immediately instead at the end of the job. You know, obviously if you're going to be using a stream crossing, you can't reclaim that stream crossing, but all the disturbed soil that resulted on either side, you can. There, you may have special construction practices such as silt fence or straw bales or something, you know, to help because you're dealing in an area where your filter strip is limited and you're right on top of the stream, you may need to create barriers of some kind. And keep your discharge water filtered and separate from the stream water. Hall road, again, these are truck roads, vehicular access. Uh, 
our West Virginia, our minimum BMP is 10% grade. So what a percentage grade is uh, a climb of 10%. So that's one foot for every 10 feet you travel. Uh, we do allow up to 15% for short distances, but if you're a truck driver and you've ever been down a 15% dirt road after a nice ice storm or a rainstorm, 15% is pretty steep. It doesn't seem like it, but it is. Graveled at least 200 feet from the public road entrance. This is primarily for safety reasons, keep from tracking mud out on the road and causing some kind of accident. Uh, positive drainage established. So we. We don't specify necessarily the exact BMP, but we have a, a range of them, broad base dips, grade breaks, ditches and culverts, whatever works for the site. Broad base dips are usually, they, they work well on roads that are under 10%. You get over 10%, you know, because you actually increase the grade of the road a little bit when you put broad base dips in for certain sections, it, you know, then you get over grade and it causes problems. Skid roads. Skid roads used to drag the timber to the landing. Uh, we recommend no greater than 20%. And this is about limiting the speed of the water. You know, steeper grades, you're gonna, the water's gonna pick up more speed. Normally 20%, but we do allow some short distances, you know, 200 feet or so, that's about as far as you wanna go over 20%. And when you get into reclamation standards or special reclamation standards for those, so keeping it under 20% is good. Now the spacing between the roads, 200 feet is recommended. And this is about, you know, limiting your potential. So if you have roads every 100 feet, you've doubled your roads. Where if you have them 200 feet apart and, you know, you should be able to, between the length of the tree and pulling cable, you should be able to get the trees to the road and get them out of the woods. Positive grain is established and maintained, whether this is uh, culverts or whatever it may be. No fords are allowed on skid roads. So we do allow fords on haul roads. If they're existing fords, there's some special standards. You have to stone within 100 feet each side of the stream and it has to have a solid stone bottom and existing ford. But on a skid road, we do not allow fords in West Virginia. And we recommend bridges for everything greater than 400 acres, simply because culvert sizes to handle like five or 10 year storm events when you start talking anything over 400 acres, you're talking six foot culverts and those get as expensive as a bridge. So landings. Do not locate the landing inside the streamside management zone unless there's absolutely no alternative. And this is an important one because it, if you are in the SMZ, say in March, you're going to have issues, I guarantee you. you know, but if you can get up on the hill, and nobody really likes to skid uphill, but even just getting up a little bit uh, and getting to a drier, firmer site especially for winter jobs and spring jobs. And that gives you distance to deal with your runoff off the landing and filter it naturally before it gets into a stream channel or ephemeral and goes directly into the stream, whatever it may be. Soil type also matters. If you can get a, you know, a rockier soil that's firmer and drier uh, and, and drains better, you're gonna be better off than you know, a red clay or yellow clay soil divert the water from the landing surface with ditches on the uphill side. And basically the, the bottom line of this is you don't want any water on your landing that doesn't fall directly on it via precipitation. And you want a slight grade on your landing to try and get the water off in a direction where you can handle it. Try to approach landings with a slight uphill grade on all your roads that enter. You know, this is great if you can do it because water won't run uphill. I mean, you, you can dam it up eventually and get it to raising level, but you can't get it to run uphill. And limit the size necessary for safe working conditions. Again, this goes back to limiting your potential and also limiting your cost in reclamation. So reclamation, what do we ask, at least in West Virginia? And like I said, these are going to be pretty close with some minor variation across the central Appalachian region. 
but let level your landing and road surfaces and establish permanent drainage. So if you have an area that's got a bunch of ruts and you know you create these little ponds and potential for water to gather and if you know if it's a little higher you create kind of an artificial dam and then that can wash out. Um, there are areas and times where you can actually use these as vernal pools but uh, lack of reclamation is not the way to do that. Uh, properly planning and putting them in, is, you know, sometimes we, we do approve that, but it's something that has to be planned ahead of time and not just, oh, I'm not going to reclaim the skitteret because it's going to make a nice vernal pool. All critical areas must be stabilized using an approved method. So this is your SMZs that I was talking about earlier, your landings, all roads over 20%. And an approved method is primarily going to be seed and mulch, perhaps lime and fertilizer, depending on the soil. Uh, we also accept like erosion blankets, different things. But as long as that area is stabilized and we don't see any evidence of wash or erosion gullies or you know, evidence that that area is not stabilized, we usually accept it. And reclamation should be complete within seven days of the close of the operation. Don't wait, reclaim the roads as you finish using them. So if you have a 200 acre job and you're logging it out a section at a time, you know, we ask that loggers reclaim the sections as they're done. And then at the end, they don't have a week or two weeks worth of dozer work and being off of productivity. And, you know, if you're doing a 200 acre job certain times a year, it, it can take you, depending on the size of your crew, a month, two months, three months. And if you have a road sitting there the whole time that's not reclaimed, it could be an active erosion issue. And when you go to reclaim it, you just have a bigger mess and more expense and getting everything pulled back where it should be. And that concludes my part of the presentation. And I know that uh, Dakota wanted me to leave this slide up for the panels and the questions. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. Thanks so much. So we have uh, several minutes now for questions. If anybody has any, um, feel free to type them into the chat box and we can ask them to all of our presenters. Um, I do have one here. It is for Madison. Um, in your outreach, how often do you interact with private landowners? And do you hold workshops, other events, or some other form of outreach? And do you mostly have positive interactions with them? Yeah, so uh, we rely um, almost exclusively on our um, interactions with landowners, um, specifically for our acid mine drainage treatment projects. Um, all of them exist on private land and have only, we've done 18 over the last 25 years and each one of them um, has only been possible because a landowner was willing and allowing us to build, you know, sometimes up to a three acre site on their property, which is an incredible, um, do, more or less donation on their part. They still own the property, but they, um, you know, them allowing us to come in and build something like this um, is, you know, just an immense partnership that I can't um, highlight enough. Um, we have done workshops in the in the past. Uh, most of the time, um, when we are reaching out to our landowners, um, we've identified the source of um, acidity via you know GIS or something to that effect. But um, we're really rural, so the best way to get a hold of folks is usually just knocking on the door and having a having a conversation um, about uh, the the issues on their property and. Um, more often than not, they're excited and willing to, you know, have some of these issues addressed. Um, and it's, it's just been a really great part of the job. I think if that answered the question, um, let me know. If not, I can expound as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Madison. Um, next question I have here is actually for Jeremy, and I think I can combine two and one because a couple people had a very similar question. Um, when talking about harvesting within the streamside management zones, the SME, SNZs, do you find that it just becomes high grade zones or 
um, are they pretty successful insofar as you see minimal erosion and sedimentation? Um, so two part question about SMZs. Do you see they become high grade zones and then are they successful in preventing sedimentation? Well, they are successful in preventing sedimentation, assuming that the BMPs are properly installed, maintained, and reclaimed. Uh, you know, and that varies, which is why we have enforcement powers and the ability to force people comply. And actually, in West Virginia, we can criminally cite people under our law, in addition to what the DEP can do under the Clean Water Act. So success basically varies on how well they implement the BMPs. And if they implement the BMPs, there's usually no problem. Uh, with the exception, sometimes they just need to leave the site because you can't work that site with those conditions that time of year. As far as the high grade zone, uh, most Eastern states and West Virginia specifically, we don't have forest practices acts. So we can't tell landowners how to cut their timber on their property. So it comes down to the land ownership and how they want to treat their property. If they're financially motivated and they don't know any better, yes, those can turn into high grade zones where they'll go in and they'll take everything of value and they'll leave, you know, suppressed overtopped red maples and wolf trees and whatever else in there. From a sedimentation standard, that doesn't really hurt anything. Uh, you know, we're still, we still have the trees there. We still have some crown cover over the stream for cooling purposes. Like in West Virginia, we don't actually have that as an official BMP yet. You could cut everything in the streamside management zone if you wanted. You just can't take equipment in there unless you're crossing. So high grading, Yes, it can be that, but that's entirely up to the landowner. And, you know, that's why I always try to recommend landowners to reputable consultant foresters who are looking ahead to the future of the forest and their overall health and not just going for a value based management practice. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. And follow up question to that um, one came in. How often are BMP recommendations revised in West Virginia? At minimum every five years. Uh, we can convene the committee earlier if need be, if something emergency comes up, but usually it's every five years. Great, thank you. All right, with that, does anybody else have any other questions that they're wanting to ask any of our presenters? Okay, well, I think then we can end about five minutes early today and everyone can eat their lunch and maybe even head off to an early weekend. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> um, but before everybody leaves, I do want to make sure I provide that link for the CFE credits, um, which Jen Chandler just put into the chat box and as well the um, emails to our presenters today. If you have any follow-up questions that you had, um, feel free to email them and they can get you some answers. Thank you, Dakota. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a fantastic day. <laughs>